what I want to talk about really tonight is the microelectronics sector. Um, this is very close to my heart and very dear to me. Um, unfortunately, if you go around and say to people, what do you know about microelectronics? What do you know about ICT? What's Bristol famous for? I wonder how many people would actually say it's, it is really famous for um, ICT. It's famous for microelectronics. And just to you know, challenge that, I, I would say every time you, you use a Wi-Fi, a wireless LAN, every time you use a phone, whether it's 3G or it's Edge, every time you use a network today, you're using something that was done here in Bristol. Every time, for most of you, when you get into a car, the energy management system stands a very, very high probability having been designed here. And I'll just say a bit more about that. So this is, we often say that Bristol hides and the region hides its strengths. I think this is particularly true of the west of England when it comes down to microelectronics. The DCKTN uh, used the BIS 2010 R&D scorecard to look at the top 169 um, companies that were in the communication space. And uh, looking at that, the R&D spend for the top 169 companies, uh, some, some from overseas, of course, many from overseas, who are in the UK, um, the spend is 3,617 million, with sales of 131 billion. The Digital Communications KTN became the ICT KTN uh, uh, this year, and so the Information and Technology Communications Knowledge Transfer Network, they found another 103 companies that fitted the definition of ICT um, in, in, in top 1,000 companies. And now we're looking at over four and a half billion uh, R&D spend and 139 and a half billion sales. So nationally, an awful lot going on, but not necessarily known. If you look at how that breaks down in, um, the, in, in terms of R&D and sales analysis, you see that the biggest sector by far in terms of R&D spend is the pharmaceutical side of the house and uh, way up here are around 9 billion and the sales are somewhere down here. The ICT sector is here um, and this is for the year 29 and so on. And so you can start to get an idea of nationally where the various uh, um, businesses sort of come together and their contribution. So ICT is big. Um, if you go on to look at the sub-segment of uh, ICT in terms of communications and all its various forms and uh, um, computing and so on, then you end up with this type of uh, set of curves here where you have the, uh, the blue line is the R&D spend and, uh, and the um, sales are in red. Now, bear in mind, I should have pointed out before, is that the sales... Uh, axis here is a very much bigger number than the R&D spend. But again, you will see that an awful lot of money is being invested in ICT. So where do we come into that in the West Country here, West of England? Looking at the various sources for, of, of information from the RDA and so on, it could be as many as 800 companies who are involved in the region. 18,000 employees, and it's twice the size of Cambridge. Now, in the community, when I go round, I often hear and, uh, of what Cambridge is doing, but we're twice as big. We are second only to California, Silicon Valley. We are second only to them in terms of what we do in our activity, but that's not known. In the last decade, Somewhere circa around this, we've had something like um, 550 million of uh, um, startups, and they've returned around 800 million to shareholders. And recently, we saw one of the uh, startups that we had here, a, co um, a company called Isera, it's just been acquired by Nvidia for 355 million a couple of weeks ago. 
and they're employing hundreds of people. Four billion of, an, of inward investment and one and a half billion of profit capital. So <coughs> what slice does our LEP in the West of England have? Well, somewhere around 40 to 50 percent. So this region, this West of England region, ha is what is really active in one of the major activities in the UK. Now, if we can't use that to our advantage, then we don't deserve to be successful. We should resign now. It is a tremendous situation we're in, and I'll say a little bit more in a second. Fantastic opportunity. The capabilities exist, and I thank um, Phil Morris from ST for this information. Um, we have a very broad range of companies and talent, and we often use the term clustering, because where you get clusters, you get people coming together with similar skill sets and abilities, and you can get flexibility, you can get movement of labor, and so on. It's a fantastic situation. You have large multinationals, such as um, um, ST, Hewlett Packard, Toshiba, Infineon, and Broadcom. We have very strong technology leaders. I just mentioned ISERA. ISERA actually come out of the University of Bristol in part, and, the, and, and so on, and, and, and in fact, have just had some great success in selling to Huawei in China. And again, one of the things that happened there was that we have a community in the microelectronics sector which is very fragmented and it makes, is made up of many, many SMEs, <laughs> but they need to gain access to facilities. SMEs can't by and large buy facilities, and so they go and work with the universities in the region to share their facility. They have to hire them and they have to pay the, you know, the appropriate amount of money. But in spend, instead of spending a million pounds to get a facility, and they might need 10 of such different types of facility, they can do it at a very reasonable rate, and by working with academics, they can then do things which they wouldn't have been able to do on their own. And that's something else I think we've forgotten as well, is that in this region, we have a very good relationship between industry and academia, second to none, as far as I'm concerned. So we have a vibrant SME sector, very strong research capabilities in the universities, Bath, Bristol, and UWE, and, uh, it, it, and I think that's recognized now increasingly over the world. When I first used to go to Japan, I never heard this region mentioned. <clears throat> I used to hear Stanford, MIT, and one or two other places. And I spent the first three years at the research, very, very embarrassing, actually. I, I, I didn't even talk about technology. I used to put a map of the UK on the board. And you imagine this as, a, as supposedly a top researcher. I, I put London, Cambridge, Oxford, and Bristol. And, and, and I used to say, well, in Bristol, we have, um, and in the region, we have Rolls-Royce, and we have Airbus, and uh, Hewlett-Packard are there. And that's why, we, oh. And it took three years to get the message across that we had something to offer. Today, I'm glad to say, nobody ever asked that question. Bristol and the surrounding region of the west of England is truly recognized as a real powerhouse in high technology, in whatever form it comes. Very strong incubators. Again, I think we've led in many respects. <coughs> we have some very good models in Set Squared at Bath and Bristol. And of course, now we have SPAR, which is going to offer tremendous opportunities for uh, certain types of business and, and, and research to expand. And I think the other thing is, um, I think we have a strong startup culture already. <coughs> Some people say that we've got the beginnings of a good startup culture. I think we've got a very good culture now in terms of startup. The two startups in the UK with the largest amount of venture capital that I've come across in our business were Isera and Pikachip, both out of here. One out of effectively Bristol and one out of Bath. And between them, they must have had around 500 million in the last few years. So really strong situation, and there's lots more coming. The opportunities are huge. Um, microelectronics is an enabling technology, as we saw in those other slides. They go right across every industry, and that's one of the problems. It's quite often, if you get aerospace, you can see, you know what aerospace is, you know about aeroplanes. But the whole business of microelectronics is in every aspect of life we do, and how you get that information and how you bring it together can be quite hard. 
and that's one of the things we want to do on the LEP. We want to make sure that the microelectronics sector is putting together as an entity, and we can truly represent that strength to the world. And the opportunities there are clearly in microelectronics and creative industries. Look at Apple, microelectronics and bi biomedical. And there we put, and there we, we put the six million dollar man some years ago. Shows my age. <laughs> and uh, um, microelectronics and green energy, smart grids. This is a huge problem. At the moment, we've got to spend in this country two fifty billion in the next twelve to fifteen years just to stay where we are, where we are with the grid. And that's not allowing for expansion in the use of electricity. The only way we're going to provide without spending huge amounts of money is to make the grid adaptive and control the amount of electricity and power we use, energy we use, and gas, and also monitor water in a way in which we get <coughs> connection between the user and the provider, the generator. So some interesting problems there. Sounds easy, but I assure you it's really, really difficult. It's such a big network. It's the biggest network that you've ever come across. Then we go on to, of course, microelectronics and aerospace, fly-by-wire, and you could say, um, if, you, if you got onto a plane and, and the pilot came on and said, oh, by the way, we're using a wireless landing system or a landing system controlled by wireless, how many of you would stay in the plane? Mm -hmm. I think you'd be getting up and walking off. And what we want to do is to look at the whole business of reliability of wireless communications. These, this, again, is another big opportunity for us in the west of England. And then we go on to key application areas and... An interesting one here, all this, you know about digital Britain, communications, wireless computing and interconnect on chips, um, sensors, machine to machine. And I'll say, and just bear that in mind, machine to machine. Is that a problem? Well, we'll see. Low power, we want to reduce power usage. And today we're seeing circuits coming out that use 10,000 of, 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 of less of the power than they would normally use a few years ago. And we're looking for novel approaches to electronics and plastics, optical MEMS, and quantum information. We are in a digital connected world. And in 1995, there were 5 million mobile connections. By 2010, there were 5 billion, thanks to China. It was 4 billion a year ago. Now it's 5 billion, um, thanks to China. In 2020, we'll have 50 billion mobile connections. <coughs> and that's through the GSM Association. But by 2020, the World Wide Radio Forum reckons there'll be 7 trillion uh, wireless connected things. What we're going to is where we implant in every, everything will have an IP address. Light bulb, your computer, your cooker, whatever, your fridge. And they're, they're going to be talking to one another. Now, one of the problems we have in the world at the moment is that how do we handle that growth in traffic? If you've got seven trillion possible connections, can the networks handle that sort of traffic? Have you tried to send an SMS on New Year's Eve? <laughs> it's quite interesting. The network wasn't designed to take that type of traffic. And so I send two SMSs to my daughters on, uh, 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 on New Year's Eve, and one might get it an hour later, and the other one will get it maybe 17 hours later. And so it's a big problem. We've got to look at how we can design such networks, they're very complex, and that's again going on between industry here and in conjunction with universities, whether it be engineering departments or mathematics departments. Big, big problem, how to design these, these networks which will become part of smart grid, <coughs> part of healthcare, and so on. So for us now, we have the, the, the greatest opportunities because of this growth because we are strong already in what's already a strong sector for UK. We've got strong SMEs, we've got strong universities. If we've got a market growing and we have all those application areas that we're expanding into, then for the West of England, we have the greatest um, opportunities and challenges that we've ever had. We want, the LEP wants to see that taken advantage of. And when people say to me, are you going to make those 95,000 jobs and all the rest of it? Well, I certainly hope so, because that's what we intend to be doing. And just to finally finish, we are unlocking the potential. We've got improved networks of interaction, things like INET. These are innovation networks. We have one in microelectronics, and we have others, uh, others in other areas um, across the industry. We're in we increase awareness of the cluster uh, around the world. Uh, 
good contacts with venture capitalists, and the world's changing. A few years ago, it took four years to go from entry to exit with a startup. Now it's around eight years. It's a, it's a, it's a changing world. A few years ago, you could do things in digital on their own, and you could make money. But today, there's very little money in digital. By and large, you've got to have analog there. So we have the strange situation that in an increasingly digital world, if you want to make, if you want to make money, you've got to have digit, um, analog in it as well. Quite strange. But this means we're going to what, are, what, are, what we call vertically integrated systems, systems on a chip. And that's how we will continue to make money. And again, we have those type of capabilities by which we can meet those demands. And we have improved connections with the growth areas of creative, bio, green, and aero. We have a science park. We have fantastic links with the higher education institutions. And obviously, we have um, a, a, a situation where we are addressing the, skill, the, the skills needs starting in the schools and going forward. And finally, we want to strengthen even further, further our startup culture. That's all we've got to do to be successful. And I think we can do it. And I think by working together, we will do it.